Hey guys, I got a lot of messages from a lot of guys talking about uh, the Westies and certain involvement we had with them. And there's a few stories and uh, people asking me about uh, Philly and Eddie. So I thought I would give you this story. When I went into prison in the WETSEC unit, I met this guy, John Fogarty. Real, real tough guy. 6'3", good looking guy, extremely well built. He was with the Westies. We got very, very friendly. And he was telling me a story that I believe it was 1989, something around that area, I'm not sure. But uh, he told me that this guy, uh, John Maselli, came to him because he had a backhoe and told him that uh, he had to dig a, a hole for someone. He said that Joe Watts had asked them to dig this hole for this guy, Tommy Spinelli who was going to be killed, and they had to make him disappear. Now, the story was true. I didn't know the guy who went to Fogarty, but he told me who it was and what had happened. Tommy Spinelli was a made guy in the Gambino family. I was in the club one day when John Gotti called me over and said, listen to this story. Jimmy Brown, a captain in the family, called me over to the side and told me that this was his cousin. He was a made guy under Jimmy Brown. Louis Fats was another cousin. He was a made guy under Jimmy Brown as well. He was there. And they both told me that this guy, Tommy Spinelli, was going to cooperate. He admitted to them that he was going to cooperate with the government. And uh, they wanted him dead. So John Gotti told me, he said, Sammy, take care of this. I said, okay. I said, Jimmy, Louie, excuse us for a few minutes. John, let me talk to you. So we went on the side and I said, bro, he's a captain. His cousin Louie's a made guy. This guy's a made guy. What the fuck is in my business? I got to go on a hit with these people. Let them, just give them permission to kill them. Why am I doing it? Sam, you know how it is, bro. If, if I don't send you, it ain't going to get done. And guys are going to go to prison. I said, all right. So I started to plan this hit. There's a lot of names involved. I'm going to talk about this on my podcast, so I'm not going to tell you the whole story now because a good part of this is going to be on my podcast. I go back to Big Louie and I tell him, I'm on another fucking hit. And he tells me, he says, Sammy, what the fuck, bro? You're the underboss, bro. You're supposed to stop going on hits when you may become a captain. And, and it goes, yeah, now you're the underboss, bro. You shouldn't be in the fucking street doing hits. I know, I know, I know. But listen, he does have a point. If he gives them approval, they'll never get it done. So I did go on the hit. Again, I'm not going to say the whole story. The guy got killed, bro. And uh, they got rid of him. I'm not sure if he went in that hole that Fogarty dug, but I'm going to go back to Fogarty. We were in jail together, and uh, we were with uh, Philly and Eddie, a guy named Gino, a made guy in uh, Philadelphia. These were Philadelphia guys. We were all doing time together. There was a whole bunch of guys. This guy, Fat Cat Nichols, a black guy, he was controlling a certain part of the areas. Good guy, great guy. A guy named White Boy Rick. They made movies about him, and... Uh, did 32 years in prison, really got screwed. 
I may do a story about him sometime. We were playing racquetball one day, me and Fogarty, and a uh, guy came off, said something. I put the racket down. I was ready to go. I mean, Fogarty was just butchered the guy, butchered him. Amazing power this guy had. Played hockey, was a hockey player for a while. Real tough guy, as tough as they come. Not just recently, I was going to say not long ago, but just recently, he got in touch with me again. Hey, Sammy, what's up? We got tight when we were in prison. I got out first. He got out and went in the program. They put him in Ohio, and I was in touch. I knew about it. I went down to Ohio for three or four days to welcome him home. I went there. I called him over. I put 5000 in his pocket. I said, welcome home. I told them what to do in the program. They want to send you to schools and stuff like that. I says, you had a backhoe in the street. You know about heavy equipment. Tell them you want to go to school for that. They'll pay for the school while you're here anyway. And uh, you could open up, you know, a trucking or backhoe, heavy equipment company. And we were making arrangements that he wanted to move down I had moved there to Arizona the first time I was out of prison. And uh, he did come down. We had a pontoon boat. I took him on the, on the lakes with the pontoon boats hanging out. It was great, great time. He met my wife, he met my kids, and he wanted to come down and stay there. Well, he went back to Ohio. A few months later, I was arrested again in that pinch in Arizona with the ecstasy and all that bullshit. That's a story for another time as well. And I lost track of him. I never came back out of prison. I did almost 18 years, 17 years, seven months, as you guys know. And we lost track of one another. And he went into a company that had heavy equipment. He bought trucks and backhoes and track hoes and he did well for himself. I got word from time to time. We never really lost total connection with one another. But now that I'm out, it was a little while ago where he got in touch with me again. How you doing, bro? So happy you're home and this and that and the other thing. And we were talking back and forth. I'm glad to hear I heard you're doing very well. You straightened your life out. I'm glad to hear that, this and that. He was telling me something about the piers. They take the, the containers off of the piers. They're all backed up. And he's fighting to get a contract, which is a pretty good contract. A couple of hundred thousand, two, three hundred thousand a year type of contract. So I was breaking his balls. Bro, is my beak in that if you get this contract? And that's when he brought it up. He said, bro, you're the only guy who came to see me. You stuck 5,000 in my pocket. I'll never forget that. This contract comes in, you're with me, bro, I got you. It felt good to hear that. It really did. A lot of people calling your names and this and that and the other thing. But I have so many relationships from the old days and people getting in touch with me in really good, kind ways, nice ways. Especially you guys listening to these, the, the, the messages and the texts that I get. It's just phenomenal. Makes me feel real good. Makes me want to tell these stories even more. Let me get back to Phil Leonetti. I knew him from the streets way before. I was pretty friendly. So when I came in prison, that prison, he was there before me. When they opened up the big doors that I walked into, he was there with three or four guys with a hug and a kiss on the cheek. That day I went to a cell. I was putting my stuff in the cell and he says, come and eat. It's time to eat. Come with me. So he sat at a table. There was about four 
and sometimes they would squeeze in five guys sitting at that table, and it was his table. He was an underboss. That was his table. That was his spot. So he took me there, and he says, this is where you sit, Sammy. I said, I, I was told that's your spot. He said, no, no more. It's yours. I'll sit next to you. We sat together in the dining room, and uh, we got along really, really good. A couple of times he got into an argument or something. If he turned around, he had a bunk into me. I was not too far away all the time. Got into an argument with a Samoan guy. I think I told this story. Big, big Samoan guy. Junior Moran, he's an Irish guy. He was with the Philadelphia people. Really another tough guy, a whole story about him. Um, and he was real close. And he tells me, he says, Sammy, we got to do something. Relax, bro. As soon as this starts, we're jumping in immediately. Don't worry about it. But Phil didn't need us. He held his ground, and they didn't fight, which was good. And we walked away. He says, Sam, he says, I love you, bro. I seen you. I seen you. You gave me that little nod. I knew you had my back. Always, bro. Always. Fuck fair fights. Fuck anything. Once we start, we going all the way. That's what I do. Good, Sammy. Me too. And we, we got along fine. Phil got out. I got out. Fogarty got out. So I wanted to tell you that little story. I know it's a little half-assed, but there's a lot of it is going to be in my podcast, so I don't want to give away too much. My producers, my director, James Carroll, will go fucking crazy. What are you doing? I hope you like the story. If you like it, press like, subscribe always. Listen to it on Patreon without commercials, no nothing. And while I'm talking about that, we're working on a whole bunch of stuff in Patreon, bullpen and stuff. I know it's taking a little time, but it's going to come out. I'm looking to do it the right way. My team is great, and they want to do it right. We're also working on season two of my podcast, The Story of My Life. I want to apologize that it's taken a while, but I'm doing so many things and it's so hard to do. Just be patient. I appreciate you being patient. I appreciate the messages that you guys are sending me. And uh, I love you guys. Adios, amigos.